So um, let me tell you a little bit about what we're going to do, and then um, I'm actually going to ask my co-panelists to just come on up here. Um, and what we're going to do is we're going to talk each of us for 10 or 12 minutes talking about Dream Tech. And then we're going to open it up to questions. Uh, we want this to be really uh, as much about what you want as what we're doing. So we'll each give you a little riff about what we're on about. And then we'll um, spend about half an hour in discussion. Um, so why don't you guys just come on up here and we'll all, we'll all take turns and say it, and then we can answer your questions all together. Um, so I'm going to, OK. Um, uh, and I will stand while I talk because that's how we uh, Okay, so um, uh, my name is Jennifer Jim Hare, and I am here to uh, introduce this panel and to talk a little bit about dream tech um, and about dreams. And dreams themselves are a way of hacking consciousness, and I'll talk about that a little bit more at the end. But what I'm going to do now is just talk about some of the currently popular ways of using tech to hack the dream state. And it's, it's pretty spectacular when you think about the fact that it wasn't until 1953 that, the, that Western science first acknowledged the relationship between REM and dreams. Like, dream science is so new. And yet there are, there's this incredible range now of ways of hacking dreams. I've got to see when I started to time myself in. Um, so I'm going to talk about a bunch of these different ways. This, this is by no means all of them, but it's some of the more interesting ones that are going on right now. And I'm going to start from the most technologically advanced, and some would say uh, invasive, ways of using tap to hack dreams, and then I'll sort of go down from there. So the first thing I want to talk about are different ways of using tech to entrain brain waves. So uh, neurotherapy. Uh, there's a form of neurotherapy right now that's called transcranial direct current stimulation, TDCS. And here's the way that works, is you put uh, positively charged electrodes and negatively charged electrodes on the brain. And the brain cells that are underneath the positively charged electrodes become primed, more likely to fire. The ones underneath the negatively charged are less likely to fire. And so the, the machine isn't actually making the brain waves fire, it's priming them to be more likely. So a really easy example is uh, it's used a lot for um, motor skills. Right, so you're learning to play piano chords more quickly and efficiently. You might put the uh, positively charged electrode over the motor cortex and negatively charged electrode uh, speech service, something that you want to find out. And then that, your motor cortex becomes more primed to fire, right? And so you're doing something that you already know how to do, which is play the piano chords, right? But the TDCS has primed the experience so that you maybe can do it faster or more efficiently. So this is used with dreams and to stimulate parts of the dream, parts of the brain that are involved in dream or in dream states. And I have, although I'm not going to speak directly to it um, because we don't have that much time, I did bring my favorite dream chart here. And we can talk about it in the break if you want. And this is um, what the different brain waves that are happening in different uh, dream states. So I'll kind of refer over to this a little bit, and then at the break we can talk about this. So brainwave entrainment. There's, um, there's a few <coughs> TDCS machines that are out there on the market. The Fisher-Wallace is one example. Um, so going kind of down a level from something like that where you're, you're really kind of zapping the brain, uh, we can talk about neurofeedback. And neurofeedback is still using EEG, but what it's doing is it's taking the EEG and it's reading what mind state you're in, where the brain waves is, are, and it's giving you back feedback. And so it helps you stay in that period. Think about in that state. Think about it as like um, getting an adjustment in yoga, right? You get the adjustment in yoga, and then you're like, okay, I'm in the right place now. And then you learn to stay in the right place. So the, the neurofeedback might give you feedback mm -hmm. that you're in RAM. 
and maybe you're trying to deepen your dreaming, maybe you're trying to lucid dream. Obviously the feedback has to be something that doesn't wake you up. Um, we'll talk about that a little bit more when we talk about masks. Um, it might, you might be wanting to go into deep sleep. Some people have a hard time staying in deep sleep. Some people have parasomnias, which are um, uh, dream issues, dream disorders, and those often in deep sleep. <coughs> or you might want to stay in hypnagogia, which is my current favorite dream state. So neurotherapy. Go down another one, and I'm going to talk about binaural beats. Binaural beats are back from the 70s, right? They've been around, around a long time. But now there are a lot of phone apps. So now we're in the realm of phone apps. And there are a lot of phone apps that allow you to work with binaural beats. And the way that these work is you have, a, if you have a tone that goes in your ear at one frequency, so hertz is how many you know, waves per second. If you have a tone that's going in one ear uh, at one frequency, and in the other ear at another frequency, your brain tries to resolve them. So let's say you've got um, 100 hertz in this ear, and you've got 110 hertz in this ear. Your brain will try to make 105, and will basically <coughs> create a brain wave that's 10 hertz, which is, again, you can see a little chart up here, which is like alpha. That's uh, awake relaxed state. So you can use binaural beats to create desired dream states. And again, you look over here, you'll see what the brain waves are of different dream states. I have a, I have a group, and it's a, an international slumber party, really. We're on the same night, people from around the world, and there are a lot of people across, mostly South America, Central America, Mexico, and the United States who are doing this. And on the same night, we all do the same onerogen, which is anything that promotes really vivid dreaming. So it might be an herb, it might be a, a sound, it might be a scent. And the last time we worked with binaural beats, there's a lot of apps that do these. Um, um, iDoser is the one that I'm currently using most often, but there are lots of them if you just look up binaural beats and phone apps. And we had, in this uh, Oneronautica, we had an amazing amount of luck using binaural beats to get us into hypnagogia, right? Which is that stage when you're just going into sleep and is a very amazing and trippy mind state. And has also been used uh, for creativity, for problem solving. So binaural beats, very commonly available. There's a few other phone apps that are great for hacking dreams. Uh, there's one called Dream On, which is pretty interesting. And what that's doing is you, you take song or a sound and you, uh, you use uh, active imagination to associate this song with something. So maybe, you're, and you're, you're basically trying to control your dreams. So maybe you want to, uh, in the dream, you want to be underwater. I want to be able to breathe underwater. I want to fly. Um, I want to meet my grandfather, whatever it is, right? And so you play the song and you sort of meditate on that association. And then dream on, after about, you have to been asleep for about five hours, your periods of REM start to get much longer. And so uh, once you've been asleep five hours, what happens is uh, dream on plays that song. And using this technology, uh, you can sort of control what the dream is through this work that you've done. I've also had an enormous amount of luck with voice-activated recorders. And with a voice-activated recorder, if you're trying, so everyone always tells you this, and in fact it's true, if you're really trying to get into a deeper relationship with your dreams, one of the primary ways to do it is to write them down or to record them. So the great thing about voice-activated recorders is you can sleep with it next to you or nap with it next to you, and then when you wake up, it, it'll just be there but won't record until you start talking. So you can, in that, that part of sleep when you're just waking up, where often getting up and starting to write down the dream, you start to forget it. A voice activated recorder will help you um, not have to go all the way out. And I have, I've been working for the last year and uh, uh, working with hypnagogia, which is the space between awake and asleep. I'm really um, trying to widen that space and like surf the edge of consciousness. And I've actually managed to uh, narrate my hypnagogic states a few times, and they're, they're extraordinary 
cool and weird and trippy. I can, I can play you the recordings of these. They're pretty fun. Um, and again, these are widely available. So I'm, I'm going to talk about one more form of tech, and that's masks. And uh, the, the most uh, popular and probably the earliest one is the Nova Dreamer. And that was created by Stephen LeBarish, who, of course, brought lucid dreaming out into our uh, collective consciousness, as it were. And uh, it's a mask that you sleep in. And it, when you start to go, when you go into REM, your eyes start to move. So there are sensors in the mask that detect when your eyes have started to move. And they react by flashing lights. And you can control the frequency and the intensity of the lights. And the idea is that you will, in the dream, see the flashing lights, and it will remind you that you are asleep and you will become lucid. Now, a lot of people have great luck with this. I personally have a lot of dreams about emergency vehicles. But, uh, <laughs> but for a lot of people, this is, a very, this is a great way of going into lucid dreaming. I'm just going to talk a little bit more about going into lucid dreaming. And there's also the Remy. And the Remy is another mask, and it does the same thing as Dream On. Basically, it, it times to five hours after you've gone to sleep when your REM periods <coughs> get longer, and uses the same uh, flashing lights to kind of get you into uh, the lucid dream state. So that's a, that's a really quick rundown on some tech, some ways that you can be using tech to hack dreams. Um, the thing that I'm really on about is using dreams to hack consciousness. Right, so dreams are this amazing mind state. It's kind of the original altered state. And it is my premise that the urge to experiment with consciousness is completely hardwired into the human experience. Little kids, we spin around in circles and roll down hills and press our hands into our eyes. As adults, it's sex and psychedelics and sweat lodges and all night <coughs> dancing and meditation. I mean, we're, we're all deeply engaged in this process of experimenting with consciousness. Our minds are these amazing, remarkable open spaces. And with dreams, they're like the original altered state. And by really learning to deepen your relationship with the dream, of really going into this space, you, you really make a much richer life experience. You go into, you, you have this whole life that you're having while you're asleep. So I'll, I'll leave you with this thought of the, of the dream as itself a consciousness hack. So when we're thinking about these ways to hack dreams, think about it in this perspective. So um, I'm going to now ask Jay to talk. And um, I met Jay actually at the Transformative Technology Conference. And I was so excited to meet him because he has a, a podcast he, as Lucid Sage. And he has a Lucid Dream podcast. And uh, I've been following his work for such a long time. And he actually showed up at the group that I had at the conference that um, Mikey was talking about and brought this amazing machine that he had built. So he's going to talk to us some about Lucid Dream. All right. Uh, my name is Jay Mutsafi. Can everybody hear me? OK, awesome. Um, I've been, you know, I'm a web developer, or web developer by trade, but I've been um, practicing, researching, and sort of digging into lucid dreaming uh, for over 10 years now. And um, I've been, uh, I've been, I started a podcast eventually when I realized nobody was talking about it enough, and I've been reading blogs and just um, discovered very quickly that sort of everything, almost everything, uh, that is out there about lucid dreaming has been there since uh, the 90s, really. And not, not, not much has changed with, uh, with a few exceptions uh, and a few technologies and a few, and a few people. Um, and I, I really realized like just the consciousness hacking thing and technology that this is one of those things that I think probably because uh, science was kind of looking at it funny um, was being postponed and delayed. Uh, if you hear scientists talking about lucid dreaming research, they all start with the caveat of how when they started, they they just like it was taboo. They 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 didn't they wanted to stay away from it or if they wanted to do it, it was sort of frowned upon and so on. And I think that kind of pushed back some scientific research. Um, 
Let me see. Oh, is that? Getting an adapter. Okay. Okay. Do you need one? You have one. Oh. Wow. <laughs> see the rest of it. If if it's logged into the um, to the Wi-Fi, then I can control it from my phone, which would be Did awesome. <laughs> it's amazing. Anyone <clears throat> <laughs> who was on? Who was on AV in school? Yeah. Okay. Anyway. Um. <coughs> fantastic. <coughs> yeah. Just uh, just hit play. All right. So you got this part already, uh, and you know I'm talking to you. Um, very quickly, with a raise of hands. Who knows what lucid dreaming is? All right, that's practically everyone. Who had one, at least one lucid dream in their lifetime? All right, not everybody, but almost everybody. Who has a lucid dream on some kind of a regular basis every once in a while? Okay, and who has a lucid dreaming practice? All right, okay, a few. That's awesome. All right, I'm going to give you the super quick rundown just to make sure to cover our bases. What is lucid dreaming? It's very simple. It's knowing that you're dreaming while you're dreaming. It's not necessarily controlling the dream. That might come later, might not. Uh, but it's just knowing that you're dreaming while the dream is still happening. And it, if you've never experienced that, which almost all of you have, it's the most striking, the most crazy experience where up until that moment, you've had dreams and you believe them completely and you take them as real. And only when you wake up, you go like, that, that was just a dream. Like, how did I fall for this again? And then one day you're in the dream and you suddenly realize that it's a dream and you're looking at your hands and looking around. You're like, this is insane. I'm in the dream and it's still happening. And it's realistic and it's remarkable. So are you dreaming right now? Are you, are you positive? Just, okay, and you can and you can check. But I, I find one of the things I find the most striking about this is that while we're dreaming, we we uh, the the mind's capacity to create a world that seems real and feels real and to convince yourself that it is real only until you wake up makes you question reality. And if it doesn't, you haven't thought about it long enough. And if you didn't want anybody to shake your grip on reality. I don't know why you came to the consciousness hacking meetup, but sorry about that. Okay, so why lucid dream? There's plenty of reasons, and I'm going to run you really quick through a few of them. This is virtual reality and entertainment value is like the thing that gets people through the door. It's the, uh, the gateway drug of lucid dreaming because this is uh, a lucid dreaming, once it's stable, is like virtual reality from 50 years into the future where you have photorealistic, full immersion, full body suit that you can't even feel, mind control to some degree over the environment. It's absolutely remarkable. And you can do anything from flying to talk to dead relatives or your imagination is, is the limit. Uh, so experiencing the impossible, breathing on the water, I mean, going to space, meeting aliens, and so on and so forth. It's just, it, it, the list is long. But there are other benefits that are not always talked about, but some of them some of them are overcoming fears and treating post-traumatic stress disorder in, uh, in scientific research. That the, one of the main reasons they want to study lucid dreaming is for nightmares and PTSD. Over, far, overcoming fears in, in pra or practice for life is one of my favorites. Um, this is, um, imagine this realistic environment where you actually can create all sorts of scenarios. And you can create something that you're afraid to do. If you have social anxiety, if you're about to speak on stage in front of a lot of people, you can actually practice this multiple times. Try to see what you say. If you, wanna, you have a hard time talking to people and so on, you can practice this. And once you actually go about it in real life, it's no longer that foreign. And you're, you're, now you've been there. You've experienced it. It's not that scary anymore. And it's tremendously powerful. Uh, working with the subconscious this is one of those things that we still don't know to what extent we might, we might be able to do. Uh, right now, you go to a psychotherapist. They send you home to write down your dreams, bring it in, and analyze them. I say in the future, they'll send you home with homework to go to your dreams and work with your subconscious directly. Uh, harnessing placebo, this uh, I put a question mark because um, there are claims that healing is possible in dreams. I don't know. I haven't done it. but. Um, I can see a theory for it if we know that placebo exists and maybe we can sort of create a realistic scenario in a dream of healing ourselves, maybe the brain can pick up and do it on its own. So placebo is just a word for we don't know how the body did it, but it did it itself. 
exploring consciousness, spiritual practices, and I'll get to that in a bit. Uh, dream, dream yoga is one of the, uh, the most ancient versions of this. Um, halfway, okay. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna jump forward even quicker. Dream yoga, Tibetan uh, dream yoga and sleep yoga has been, practicing, been practiced for a thousand years or more um, for meditating in a dream and, and uh, advancing, reaching enlightenment and practicing uh, for death. Western science, back in the 70s, 75 and 77, I believe, two scientists separate, separately, Keith Hearn and Stephen LeBurge, uh, basically found a really clever way to prove um, lucid dreaming as a real pheno scientific phenomena by tracking the eye movements because they correspond to your eye movements in dreams. So they had someone um, agree on a particular pattern. So you look left, left, right, right. You do the lucid dreaming Konami code and you're, you're good to go. You're activating it. Thank you for the nerds in the house. <laughs> um, the bottom line is that lucid dreaming is very, very hard. Um, there are all sorts of uh, practices and techniques and supplements and, and gadgets and so on. And for the vast majority of people, it is tremendously hard and they work a lot for it and achieve very little. Um, and that's a problem that I'm trying to set out to solve. And a, lo a lot of people are trying and I think we can finally make some, some bigger strides than before. Um, how to lucid dream, I'm not gonna teach you, but there are a multitude of techniques this I usually use to illustrate uh, how difficult it is. And if somebody tells you it's easy or for them it was a piece of cake, they are unique, I assure you. I talk to so many people um, on the um, Lucid Dreaming subreddit on, uh, on Reddit, and I, I, I'm a moderator, but even before I was a moderator, I, I just talked to so many people f that write in for the, uh, for the podcast and so on, this is, and myself included. Even 10 years, this is very, very hard. Um, if I offer you one advice, if you do wanna do it, uh, write down a dream journal. This was a great idea with the voice activated. It's, it's brilliant. Um, current technology is uh, very unfortunate. It, it comes down to this. Now, this is, this is very clever. Don't get me wrong, and I'm not harping on any of the previous techniques or the technology that is right now, but this was invented in the 90s, and there hasn't been an improvement on this since. The mask that came up after the Nova Dreamer, the Nova Dreamer was, was again in the 90s. This came out a few years ago, and had even less functionality, like it couldn't detect when you're dreaming, so it works on a timer, which again, is still useful to a certain degree, but you have to pick up on the signal, an external signal. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's still very hard to do. Hmm? Yeah. So imagine lucid dreaming is like the internet. Uh, if uh, It's an, an amazing scene. Somebody, somebody invented the internet and they invented modems to connect to it, but 90% of the modems just don't connect. They don't work. You don't know why. It's just, it's, it's disastrous. And I think lucid dreaming right now is like the internet that, that few people can connect to. So um, lucid dreaming in the brain, uh, scientific study in 2009, brilliant, uh, was showing how um, during waking, in particular, like higher cognitive functions and abstract thought were generating 40 hertz gamma uh, uh, brain waves. And during REM, there's, uh, it's a different, different uh, types of brain waves and uh, some activity from wakefulness, but still uh, brain is asleep. In lucid dreaming, they're showing that gamma is reactivated in, in the front of the brain. And uh, this basically gave me the idea of trying to uh, get the brain to, to, to produce gamma and see if we can reverse engineer lucid dreaming. And I discovered TDCS and I set about creating such a device. And about a few months after I started building it, the same, uh, the same people who did the first study in 2009 had the exact same idea and using TACS with alternating current basically had a proof of concept. 77% of the Participants, they managed to induce with 40 hertz gamma with transcranial alternating current simulation. And what they did is they gave me a proof of concept that what my idea actually will work and does work and how to do it, they've sort of mapped it out, which is amazing. But I wanna point out, this is still very difficult. This is my friend Mike, uh, who is an awesome and prolific lucid dreamer. And when they put you on, uh, in, a, in a lab and you have to sort of kind of try to lucid dream yourself, even if you're relatively good at it, you have all this stuff on your head, wires coming out, it's very hard to sleep, let alone just activate a dream. Um, so I wanted to show you the examples. We set about creating our device, 
and testing it on ourselves. I'm not going to show you myself sleeping because I don't look good in those pictures. Uh, and that's was born the Ken Show. Uh, I can tell you about the name later. It's not very important, but I kind of love it. Some people might not. It's controversial, perhaps. This is this current version of the prototype. It doesn't look like much, but that's how prototypes are supposed to look like. It's an exposed board with wires, and we're using uh, a sort of knockoff of the Nova Dreamer to detect REM just for the eye movement, not for inducing lucidity. And this is what it might look like in the future, a sort of thin headband that you wear as you go to sleep. And the idea is to just put it on, effortless lucid dreaming, go to sleep, and this gets you there for the, for the most part. And I'm just going to wrap it up by saying that, by, by giving the, the, the number one reason I think lucid dreaming is important and why I want to sort of solve the modem problem of getting on the internet. Because for all the benefits of the things that you can do in lucid dream and so on, um, only when I was a little kid did I wake up in the morning and I was sort of energetic and I was jumping out of bed and going jumping on my parents' bed or running to my, as soon as I had a Commodore 64, I would just run and go play video games and, and was just happy and go lucky as soon as I woke up. And somehow in adulthood, just you have to wake up with an alarm, you wake up groggy. Very few people wake up like already energetic and fun and happy-go-lucky. And just, you know, really also depending on my dreams, I would wake up and I would be sort of have this pessimism over my, my visual field that would take hours to dissipate. And it drove me nuts, except when I would have a lucid dream. Because I could, it's not just that I could do anything I want. I would just start flying, which is the most exhilarating, most amazing experience. I think a person can have. It's absolutely amazing. And I would wake up smiling. And I would wake up energetic and happy. And I was like, how is this? There's a, such a wide range. And all it took is having a lucid dream and having, having some fun or an exhilarating experience. That's amazing. And I want to give that to other people because you can see, because dreams are so realistic, lucid or not, you see how much they affect you. If you have a nightmare, if it's very intense, you wake up. Some people wake up crying. You wake up startled. You, it really affects you. And I think it affects the brain. It affects the body, the physiology. and affects us emotionally, and it changes how our day looks. And when you can wake up tremendously happy, it changes your day, and it changes your life. And that's what I'm trying to do. Thank you. Did you bring your shampoo? Yes, I can, after, after this, I can show the prototype. I brought it with me. Um, I'll be happy to demonstrate that later on. You're a sleepover party for anyone else. <laughs> um, so uh, now I uh, have the really incredible pleasure of introducing Kelly Bogley. He's, he's one of the mainstays of the gym community. He's been doing this forever. He's past president of ASD. He's uh, quite personal for me 25 years ago when I was just starting out in his career. I wrote him. I like, shy little letter, and he was great and encouraging, and, and, and he really is one of the most important people in the field, and I'm thrilled to have him here. So. Um, well, thank you, Jennifer, for, for having me here, and I'm, I'm, I'm really excited to talk a bit and then hear back from you. The, the introductory comments you made um, were so interesting and so um, what I've been trying to work on, the kinds of things you were talking about, and sounds like you might have some really good feedback for me. So um, uh, what I've been working on recently, what I'm going to uh, uh, say some things about, um, uh, research-wise is coming from a book that's coming out in, in March called uh, Big Dreams, uh, The Science of Dreaming and the Origins of Religion. Uh, it's a book I've been working on for several years. Uh, it follows up on the, the thesis of um, anthropologist E.B. Tyler and philosopher Frederick Nietzsche and some others who claim that the origins, the experiential origins of religions are in dreams, that the, the first place that humans came up with the idea of a uh, a separable soul from the body, an afterlife, gods and demons, and so on and so forth, came in dream experiences. And what I tried to do was um, uh, take that idea, which, which I think is a good idea, but to provide some empirical substance for it and show how uh, current research on the, uh, uh, the evolution of sleep, the psychology of dreaming, uh, current research on the brain and how, how dreaming emerges out of the brain, all support that 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 thesis of Tyrone Nietzsche and others that dreaming is indeed a, an experiential wellspring, is the way I put it, an experiential wellspring of religious experience. Um, 
So that's what I've been writing about, but what I, what I want to share with you tonight are some thoughts about where dream research and, and, and current technologies of studying dreams might be going, and, and maybe some of your thoughts about how, how to um, develop that. Uh, over the years, uh, various people have contacted me when they've come up with a, a system for interpreting dreams online. You know, since the, the, the rise of the internet, there have been many, many efforts to provide a, a portal or a system by which people can share a dream or share a series of dreams and get some feedback, get some insight about that. Uh, and I'm happy to speak with anybody who's interested in putting something like that together. I think it's wonderful, spread, spread the information, help people make sense of things. And I've also felt, uh, wow, this can really be done better and it can be done worse. And I'd really like the people who are working on these things to develop things based, if possible, on, on what, what researchers know about, about sleep and dreams. And not many people take my advice on that front, but, but, but I have been learning and I've been refining the, the, the pitch I make to people. And, and what I see are um, several strategies that people come back to as they try to develop uh, digital versions of dream interpretation systems. One, they, they offer links to uh, symbol dictionaries, right? You have a dream of water and it links you to what some symbol dictionary says about water. Um, other systems provide ways that people can self-code their dreams, input their dreams, and over time tag them with different symbolic uh, notations, and then over time you can track your pattern. That's another way. Um, some systems provide people with a connection with a live interpreter, sort of a, you know, like, a, like a live chat kind of situation, which is, which is good and helpful. Um, and then several newer uh, approaches have tried to uh, work with the magic of, of, of social networking and putting dreams out there and people comment on them and share them and like them and do different social networking things with them. Um, and all of these approaches have their, their place and their value, but none of them have really seemed to kind of ignite the, the big interest and I think the big potential in developing uh, some kind of um, online uh, uh, dream interpretation system. And I think where they're all uh, uh, sort of underperforming their potential is because they don't have a, a, a foundation in any kind of research, in any kind of empirical scientific study of what happens in dreams and what we know about dreams. And actually there's more than a century's worth of, of uh, research now on that exact uh, topic. So uh, my hope, and I've, I've, I've developed uh, in, in recent years an a online database called the Sleep and Dream uh, database. Uh, 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 I've done that in uh, coordination with uh, Bill Domhoff at UC Santa Cruz, a uh, social scientist, uh, psychologist who um, created the Dream Bank and the DreamResearch.net websites, which are basically the best online resources for studying dreams in a scientific way. Um, and the Sleep and Dream database is an attempt to create something that's a little more um, flexible, more um, attuned to the kinds of questions that I have. In, I mean, I, my background is in the psychology of religion, the cognitive science of religion. So some of the questions I have are different from kind of mainstream psychologists, but uh, the Sleep and Dream database has been kind of my way of um, trying to use big data type analytics to study large collections of dreams, either uh, sets of dreams from, say, several thousand survey participants or hundreds or in some cases thousands of dreams that an individual has um, been recording over a period of years and looking for patterns and looking for um, uh, recurrent themes that, that, that might uh, correlate with things going on in the person's waking life. Um, in dream research, we call that the continuity hypothesis, that the frequency with which someone dreams about something is an index of the importance, the emotional importance of that to the person in their waking lives. It's not a perfect hypothesis, doesn't apply everywhere, but it's a, a good working um, premise for doing a lot of research. And, uh, uh, one thing that Bill Domhoff and I have been doing over the years is um, some experiments in what we call blind analysis. And what that involves is Bill Domhoff will send me a set of dreams from someone I don't know whom, uh, and I will put them through my, my database system and do some very simple word search processes. I never read the dreams, I never look at the dreams themselves, I only look at word usage frequencies. And then I compare those frequencies to uh, baseline frequencies that, that I and other researchers have been developing over the years and make inferences about the person's waking life based on 
you know, what we see in, in the frequencies of their dreams versus what we see in these baseline sets. And then the dreamer will confirm or disconfirm the various inferences, and we, we go on from there and learn some things. Uh, and so what we found uh, to this point is that dream content is a very accurate reflection of people's social relationships, the, the, the people who are important to them in waking life, their emotional temperament, their sexual desires and activities, their daily routines and, and sort of uh, general things they do in, in, in daily life, um, regular places they go, regular people they see. Um, uh, spiritual and religious belief, something I'm particularly interested in, that comes through very clearly in, in patterns of uh, dream content. Um, and also uh, uh, cultural interests, uh, artistic interests, the kinds of movies people like, the kinds of political uh, ideologies they may have. I've done a lot of research on that. Um, and so what we're, what we're slowly but surely generating are some consistent uh, uh, correlations between patterns and dream content and waking life uh, concerns and emotional interests. And in my view, that's where any kind of online digital interpretation system needs to start, is with those kind of really solid, grounded, replicable, transparent, anybody can retest and take a look and see where that came from kinds of uh, principles. And then we can build some things up and give people feedback that's based on something, that's not a random dream dictionary from who knows where, uh, that's based on research so people aren't kind of stumbling about on their own. Um, and so this I find very exciting. We're, we're kind of picking the low-hanging fruit uh, at this stage in terms of finding these correlations. There's many more I think we're going to end up finding. Uh, working with metaphors, uh, with discontinuities, with symbols, that's a, that's a whole other level and how to um, in this kind of statistical, quantifiable way of approaching dreams, how to work with those uh, dimensions of dreaming, which are definitely there. Um, I'm very mindful of the history in, in science fiction and fantasy literature of uh, efforts to create dream amplifying devices that really go you know, in bad places, uh, you know, from Ursula K. Le Guin's The Lathe of Heaven, uh, the 1984 movie Dreamscape, uh, 1991 movie Until the End of the World, Inception from a few years ago. There, there are lots of sci-fi uh, dystopic visions of what can be done with this kind of technology um, when we start hacking dreams and we start you know, being able to enter into our dream spaces, other people's dream spaces, in some ways where we as researchers or technologists some, in some ways know more about other people's dreams than they know themselves. This enters very... Um, murky uh, ethical territory. So I think that's, that's part of why I like having conversations with people like you is to um, figure out what are the issues? What should we be looking for? How can we enhance the, the, the beneficial applications and the things that are gonna help people and open up possibilities? And how can we be mindful of the uh, potential abuses and, and misuses and, and, and things that um, we wouldn't like to see happen? So. I guess I'd probably end uh, you know, this part of things just by saying uh, I think that the kinds of um, awareness that's possible when people start paying attention to their dreams and tracking them and, and, and generating lucid dreams, and this is something I'm fascinated by as well, um, I'm talking in some ways about just general dreaming, just sort of tracking one's ongoing dream experience and learning about it and reflecting on it and recognizing one's own <laughs> recurrent patterns and themes and uh, experiences, that creates, in my view, a, a, another level of lucidity, another level of kind of meta-awareness of the dream experience. And I'm really curious, this is kind of the edge of where I'm thinking, I'm curious what that higher level of awareness of our, the broad span of our dreaming experience, how that can affect not just our waking perceptions of ourselves in the world, but our dream experiences themselves. How does that, that knowledge that we gain by analyzing our dreams in the waking state feedback into the dreaming experience itself. That's, that's, that's the question of the moment for me. So, all right, thank you. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna take questions. Um, before we do that, I'm gonna, I do have, I mentioned my uh, dream group, and I, I'm gonna pass around my mailing list. Do you have my pen? Yes. I'm gonna, I'm gonna uh, pass around my mailing list. There's never more than a mailing a month. 
And if you're interested in participating or learning more about these activities, uh, please feel free to sign up and just pass it around. And so now we're just we're gonna just take questions and uh, see what you want to talk about a little bit more. Uh, okay. First of all, thank you all for your excellent presentations. Um, I'm really interested in uh, the overview that you present, also the technology that you guys presented. Uh, I've explored lucid dreaming for a number of years. I've uh, used uh, dream mask, I've all kinds of different techniques. I got to the point where I was having about a lucid dream at night. It was really cool, but the reason I'm not doing that anymore is because it's incredibly difficult. There's a lot of sleep deprivation involved. There's a lot of techniques you have to apply throughout the day, throughout the night. It just got to be too exhausting. So I'm happy to hear you guys talk about the future of technology and how technology can make it easier. Oops. Wouldn't good to me. That's fascinating. Oh, I'm particularly yeah. interested in your Kencho device and how easy that should, in theory, make it to Lucid Dream. Um, I'm wondering if, I'm wondering if there are ways to make it even easier. Um, if well, there are a few issues. One is I'm a little wary of doing anything that messes with my brain. I guess that's sort of a corollary question: is how would you answer people who are concerned about messing with their brains, to put it here, here. colloquially? Um, also, uh, with this, I have a couple questions about the Nova Dreamer. Maybe you, maybe you, either of you, any of you know about that. Um, they've been the Luc Stephen Leberge's Lucidity Institute has been promising the Nova Dreamer two for years, <laughs> and they That's keep true. just saying it's around the corner, it's around the yeah. corner, and then we don't see it. So, a, do you know when it's coming? And b, do you know how different and what ways it's going to be different from the Nova Dreamer one? And then the the sort of more futuristic question I have is with the. Uh, Advances in technology, infrared cameras, things like that, is there any hope of ever having a completely, a device that's not in contact with you at all? Because I hate wearing mm -hmm. things, even though yours looks mm -hmm. great and very slim, at least in theory. Um, is there any hope of having infrared cameras that can actually see mm -hmm. from a distance our eye movements and you know send back some sort of mm -hmm. feedback so we don't have that? any sort of anything on us. So I think we probably all have something to say to that one. Um, I'll, I'll just jump in with just a couple of really quick ones. Sure. Uh, one of them is uh, uh, galantamine um, is uh, really, it's um, an Alzheimer's treatment and it, in an organic form, it's red spider lily. And um, galantamine is a great way of bringing on lucid dreaming. And if you go onto my website, which is the Urban Dreamscape, Dot com and go to the Oneronauticum section. You can read about glantamine. We've worked about it with a lot. Um, so if you don't want to be zapping your brain. Mm -hmm. And then there's a lot of really old practices, Tibetan Buddhist practices that are very hardcore with meditation, but you don't want to be zapping your brain. That's, uh, that's another way of doing it. And then you know things like the Nova Dreamer or the, the Dream On are, are working with a kind of a feedback. But again, they're, they're sort of not doing anything with your brain waves. So those are all really interesting. Alternatives, and you can ask me a little bit more about that in the break if you want. Mm -hmm. uh, well, uh, needless to say that um, there's this, this subject is so gigantic, uh, dreams and sleep, uh, even and even lucid dreaming. So this is a trimmed down version of a 30-minute talk, so it's, it's hard to kind of encapsulate everything. But I do want to address the, uh, um, the, the supposed dangers or zapping your brain. And what else can we do that's not using a device to put on our heads? Uh, for, the second thing is I, I'm going to put my bet on neurofeedback. That we will first of all, meditation works, but that takes a long time too. And like you said, the, the cost is so high of practicing these things. I think neurofeedback, if people apply that particularly to gamma or lucid dreaming, maybe somebody can figure out the particular recipe to have a, a quicker training <coughs> ground to get used to these states. And I think that that would work well. I actually have a theory that if the device we're building works well, um, it will it will eventually make make itself uh, disposable. Like I think that your brain will pick up the habits and the neural connections, and will be able to do that on its own. Um, as for TACS, TDCS, zapping your brain, it's not a very known technology, but it's been it's been used in academia and scientific. Uh, uh, arenas for decades now, and it's established very, very well as safe. And it, it, if I give you, it doesn't matter the actual numbers, but most CDCS uses uh, two milliamps. We're using 0 0.5, uh, and two milliamps is considered like safe across the board. And there's very little uh, downsides. I mean, you can always misuse a technology, 
we're not releasing anything to the market before I'm absolutely as certain as can be that this is relatively safe. I mean, even cars are not that safe and we still <laughs> use them. It's all a matter of being informed and knowing what, knowing what we're doing. Yeah, so, so we're, we're, I think to the question, we're, we're talking in some ways about lucid dreaming, which is a, a, a more intensified form of sort of dreaming in general, and then the role of dreaming in human life and human consciousness sort of throughout. <clears throat> Um, so there's a time and a place for intensified focused efforts on lucidity or other kinds of altered states in dreaming, but I don't think anybody would suggest that that should be sort of what you do forever, for, you know, every single day, every single night, forever. There's, there's a rhythm to it, and that I think is also the, maybe the best answer to the question of, you know, could you get in over your head, could you create some sort of problems? Uh, I'd ha I have to say this sort of in the base of trust, but your dreams will let you know. Like if you're pushing something too far, <coughs> dreams in some ways are a feedback system. So all of these practices I think should be framed in a sense of like you're <coughs> experimenting with, with something that's, that, that has its own intention and its own plans. You know, your unconscious is not an inert lump of stuff. That, that you can kind of fiddle with. I mean, it, you can, but it's going to fiddle right back with you. So that's just something to keep in mind with any of these kinds of technologies. Any information about the Nova Dreamer 2 or the possibility <laughs> oh, of having yes. a camera? Uh, the Nova Dreamer 2 actually exists. I know several people who have used it and seen it. Uh, mm -hmm. I think Stephen LeBurge, as far as I can tell, is using it more for his studies and for his uh, thing. Although he plans to get it out on the market, it's been promised for 10 years, so don't hold your breath, but it, it is real. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. I have a question about. Can you please mm -hmm. actually uh, stand just because we don't have a <coughs> Is that okay? Would you mind standing? Oh, uh, just so everyone can hear. Uh, I'm curious about the difference between the REM sleep and the lucid sleep, sleep and the PTSD. Um, if anyone can talk to me about how to stop lucid dreaming, please do, but don't talk to me now. Uh, I was told that no REM sleep or lucid sleep will make PTSD sufferers worse. How can you put up lucid dreaming helping PTSD? Does, does what I said ask make sense? Yeah, so there are, um, and I'm sure you can both speak to this as well, but there are um, some studies that have been done uh, working with people who suffer from PTSD, um, Gulf War, for example, and nightmares is a big component of this. And so using lucid dreaming to, uh, teaching them lucid dreaming so that they, in their nightmares or in their dreams, can actually address some of the things that's causing the suffering. So lucid dreaming has actually been used as a way of uh, helping people tr treat or face their PTSD. And that's that relationship. I mean, and in terms of lucidity and REM you're talking about. Um, lucid, so REM is the sleep, the dream stage. Uh, again, there's a chart over here. And in, when you're sleeping, um, what your brain waves are doing, in REM, your brain waves are actually doing the same thing as they're doing when you're awake. And so lucidity usually happens in the REM period, and that's kind of the relationship between those things. Okay, but my research says that you don't undo fear. You keep re-experiencing re the fear when you lucid and when you REM. You're not undoing your fear. You're, you're, you're reinforcing and deepening. Well, there have been, there have been so there's been some success in studies where people are actually using it, not only for PTSD, but also for grief counseling. You know, mm -hmm. uh, finally even having that conversation with your dead mother, for example. You know, so people have been using lucid dreaming for a lot of these kinds of things. Do you guys want to undo anything? Yeah. No, go for it. Uh, well, I think the one just, just, response to that is that, that I mean, the therapists I know that work with lucid dreaming and people who have suffered some kind of trauma, usually the lucid dreaming is an opportunity to revisit the traumatizing experience in a safe space. And so it's an opportunity to desensitize a little bit that fear reaction. Um, this, is, this is the theory anyway. How well that works depends on each case. But, but the idea is that to start with that fear the lucid dreaming experience allows an opportunity to kind of dial it down over time and kind of return, you know, to that. Yeah, so there, just, uh, just to clarify a few things. Um, so, so REM is just the stage, the, the, the sleep stage uh, in sleep that, that dreams occur in. I mean, they occur in other stages, but that's sort of the, 
the main one, and you need REM. The brain needs to process that in that particular way. So reducing REM is not a healthy thing in general, although people use that to avoid having very, very nightmarish dreams. Uh, there's different types of trauma, by the way, and I'm not uh, uh, a doctor or a physician. I'm not prescribing anything. I had extreme nightmares as a kid, so I, I can speak a little about it, but, but not in, in the, the medical terms. Um, and lucid dream, just to, uh, lucidity, just to clarify again, is just the fact that you know it's a dream as opposed to not knowing that it's a dream. And what that allows, or what that can allow, it doesn't happen automatically, is to um, face these experiences with a giant reduction of fear, or even a slight reduction of fear, and being able to do something as opposed to just avoid the experience altogether, which is almost the same concept as using the, now the studies on using MDMA uh, with psychotherapy to help PTSD is because one of the effects is that you can actually talk about and work through these processes without completely you know, uh, going off, off the wall or having an extremely hard time. Uh, so people who usually tell me I want to stop lucid dreaming, I want to stop knowing that it's a dream, uh, usually when I talk to them more, not all of them, uh, it, 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 they just point out that what they don't want is the, is the content of the dream, not the fact that they know it's a dream. Once they actually learn that they have an ability to influence something, their selves, the environment, the dream, the nightmare, and so on, they gain a new found like liking to lucid dreaming, but that's not always obvious to begin with. I hope that helps. Yeah. <clears throat> Why don't you guys talk about content? And what the dreams actually do. Okay, I'm an old school kind of guy. In the past few years, I have opened up the idea. My dreams are telling me more than I really thought I could get from them. Although I've had precognitive dreams for decades. Okay, so when you said content right now, I'm like, wait, because <clears throat> my content's waiting from somebody else's. Yeah. So maybe the question for me would be, what kind of content? understanding experience could come from the tech we're talking about. This is a good one for you to start with. Yeah, well, um, the, the content that, that, that you perceive in a single dream uh, is interesting, but, but Carl Jung was one of the first psychologists <laughs> to point out that, that, that um, we can see much more in series of dreams, L seeing recurrent themes, recurrent patterns, recurrent elements, characters, and such. And each person does have kind of a distinctive, I'm not sure it's as distinctive as a fingerprint, but a, a unique pattern of, of dream content. Um, and like I said, I've, I've looked at people's uh, dream series, they say 100 dreams, 1,000 dreams. The biggest one I've looked at has been 3,000 dreams. And once you get up to 3,000 dreams, you can see a lot about a person's life. So I think the first, the first place where the tech can be of help is giving us that kind of bird's eye view of our own dream space in a way that's, that's hard unless you're a really avid dream journaler and you've been really keeping track over the years, is hard to do without some sort of technological help. Um, and so that's kind of where we are, which is uh, an ability to sort of mirror back what, what are the recurrent themes in your dreams that make you different from other people. Um, that, that I think that there's, there's a lot to be learned from that, a technology that, that could provide that kind of insight. So, anyway. I, um, I have been uh, twittering a dream a day for seven years. And so I have thousands of them. Onerifer, anyone want to come and look? O-N-E-I-R-O-F-E-R, Onerifer, and I twitter a dream a day, doing this for seven years. And uh, it's so fun to go back and look at them. And you really, I really do see things reappearing. I mean, they're short form, you know, 140 characters for a dream. But you know, when I, sometimes, once in a while, just for fun, I go through and I read them all. And it, and it is amazing the things that I see. Oh, boy, howdy, there are a lot of whales in my dreams. You know, and you're like, wow, look, there's another one. You know, so that's, that's a, I mean, it's pretty fun. And, and I actually, if you, I mean, I actually know a lot of people who've, who've taken this on as sort of like the Twitter dream journal, because it's fast. You know, and you can, you really can, um, you really can hold them for a lot of content. Yeah, it's. I think it's nearly all about the content at the end of the day. I mean, it, that's what relates to the person, and that's what it's about. It's, it's experiences, it's symbolism, it's 
a lot of things and different things to different people, and it's really uh, hard to convey because we're talking about the tech and methods because a lot of people mm -hmm. don't remember their dreams, let alone have access to something like lucid dreaming and so <coughs> on. Uh, but I think that once we get through the door, once people actually pay attention to their dreams, and definitely once, if people write down their dreams digitally, the, uh, the, the, just the insights for your own dreams, just even looking uh, and searching and kind of uh, things that find, find patterns in data, and which is, <coughs> I wouldn't say superficial, but it's just one layer, uh, just tremendous things come out of that. And once you really, uh, you, you no longer throw away your dreams as if they're negligible or not important, just transformative, uh, mm -hmm. just coming out of that. Yeah, Sarah Crucial. Yeah. So speaking about content, how much we have encountered uh, geometric uh, shapes or fractals or this, this kind of geometrical patterns during lucid dreamings and, and how you see that? Because what I've experienced and many of my friends have been experiencing about fractals and geometrical patterns and they were mimicking that in the part. So do you have some experience to share there? I don't have those a lot in, in dream, regular dreams or lucid <coughs> dreams, and unfortunately, I, and I'm not sure why, and this I would, wanted to ask you later, um, my <coughs> hypnagogic state is very fuzzy. I, I can barely, I, I almost always skip it, and then dreams I can remember very well for some reason, but I think that for some people, the patterns come in those like liminal transitional uh, spaces, so maybe you can talk more about that, but I, unfortunately, I, I don't know. Do you have one for that? Well, a little bit, yeah. So, so when I look at um, sort of the, the big spectrum of dream types, there's, there's dreams that, that have a, a, a strong relational dimension, and I, I put this on a, a polarity between sexuality and aggression, and so there are a lot of dreams that happen somewhere on that spectrum. And then there are dreams that, that I think have more gravitational themes, and the classic versions of that are flying dreams and falling dreams. And in those kinds of dreams, more gravitationally oriented dreams, that's where geometric, um, abstract, inanimate type phenomena seem to predominate. It's not a relational dimension. Um, and most people ex experience them negatively. Uh, it's scary. It's like, whoa, where'd all the people and the animals go? You know, it's just like these shapes. Um, but they also have a mystical potential too. So, and, and that's, that's very common in religious history is visions and, and, and dreams with spectacular geometric uh, qualities. Yeah. That, that reminds me of one thing, actually in my childhood nightmares, that's the only time I had abstract, complete abstract dreams. Um, so uh, what Jim's talking about is true that there is, um, uh, there's not a lot of studies of hypnagogia, but there's a really classic one um, uh, by uh, Marvaratus, and he's talking about the four phases of hypnagogia. Um, and that, and you know, so faces and where narrative is kind of near the end of it. And one of the early phases of hypnagogia is understood to be shapes, you know, sort of floating shapes, distinct shapes. And so when I, when I, I do get more of this when I'm in hypnagogic, hypnagogic states, although I did have a crazy dream about eating tetrahedrons <laughs> uh, all that long ago, which is <laughs> very strange, yeah. This happens in the beginning or the end of your sleep period. So meaning when you just before you wake up or just when you go to sleep, does it just mean to you that it's blurbs of data that's running around your brain and trying to sort out into something and its meaning might not be anything big or huge or, or you know, sentimental to you. It's just lots of data trying to find a way out or just connecting to one another. Because most of the time when you dream and these dreams, um, and, and you know, you, you dream or in a sense you sleep in order to remember what you've done during the day, it doesn't happen during this phase. It happens during other phases of your sleep. And in this lucid dreaming, it could be just lots of different things that happen to you during the day or during the last period, they just... So there are um, a, few, a few answers to that. One of them is that you actually dream all night. Um, right. you, and, you know, and, so... You know, uh, but the lucid dreaming only happens in the end and the beginning of your... Usually that's true, um, but so... 
Right, I mean, although you're starting, I mean, you know. Throughout the night. It's, I mean, if you, if you see here, once you're at like three and a half hours, you're starting to go into more REM. So, I mean, you know, if you're, and the longer you sleep, the more REM you get. So if you, so, that, so there's periods right here of the stage two sleep and the REM sleep. If you sleep 10 hours like some of us do, um, then your REM periods actually start to get much longer. So in, in that sense, um, uh, it can be sort of throughout the night. And then the other, the other thing is when people are talking about, isn't it just kind of random data running around in your head that you're organizing into thought? Well, isn't that kind of, I mean, that's kind of what thought is in a way. I mean, you know, it's random data running around that we're organizing into thought. So the experience of the dream is in a way the, what the experience of consciousness. It's the experience of the mind. And I like to think about dreaming as like a mind state. It's a consciousness state. Um, and so, uh, so dreaming, is, dreaming is kind of thinking. Dreaming is uh, a, a way of, of, having, of having consciousness um, of, of its, in and of its own. I don't understand how, when you're not controlling it, and the brain just generates its own data and its own like thoughts or scenarios, if you call it, then, you know, for, for me, I can't understand how that <coughs> anything, you know, meaningful and not just things that get connected because they, they basically um, uh, synch synchronize together <coughs> to generate this sort of but you're thinking about dreams only in the context of being meaningful in the waking consciousness. Now, instead of, instead of thinking about that, instead of thinking about your dream is, is, is relevant, is, has meaning to the waking self, thinking about the dreaming self, right? So does your, I mean, to what extent does your waking self have meaning in the dream, right? It's, you know, think about it as the reverse. Yeah, well, well, and there's, yeah, a couple, I mean, this is a big question because it kind of goes to what is happening in dreams. And one, one answer is uh, lots of things, so many things. There are lots and lots of different kinds of dreams, different dimensions of dreaming. And so this, this project I've just finished, I've been focusing on what, are, what Carl Jung originally called big dreams, which are extremely memorable, basically unforgettable dreams that, that seem to reflect the brain-mind state in a highly activated mode. Um, and it's, it's an approach that acknowledges that, yeah, we forget most of our dreams, you know, and, and that, to take the data seriously, has to suggest that we can all get along fine without remembering every one of our dreams. But naturalistically, observing history and cultures, we see, wow, people every now and then wake up really remembering certain dreams really strongly. What's going on with that? Um, and I think that, that there, maybe the easiest way to answer the question is that, that the function of dreaming at that level is keeping our minds flexible and active. It's not even about the, the content of the dreams. It's the ability to dream, to imagine something beyond what is, you know, to, to envision what might be. And the dreaming in, at that level is, you know, has all sorts of adaptive benefits and just keeping our minds flexible and adaptive and able to solve problems when the environment throws things at us. So, um, I mean, there's a lot more to say about, about the, the, the contents of particular dreams that I think go beyond maybe what, what, what I'm hearing you say, but, but just forget the content. <laughs> just look at dreaming, the fact that we dream and that our minds every night simulate these wild counterfactual situations that, that then our minds are stimulated to try to make sense of and figure out. I, to me, that's a that's a, a valuable and adaptive cognitive function right there. So, yeah. I, I would just add to that that yeah. we the fact is that we still don't know exactly how or why the brain is generating the images that it's generating. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of theories, and saying that it's just mm -hmm. a random jumble of trying to process stuff mm -hmm. is an assumption to some degree. Okay, but uh, but even but even if you take that on top of that, people still derive meaning from their dreams, and especially in psychology, uh, you see that there are insights there for. Particular insights for particular people. I'm, I'm sorry, I might have like. No, no, it's okay. Yeah. No, no, it's a fair question. I meant specifically the lucid dreaming and not dreaming throughout the night. 
Okay. Just because mm -hmm. lucid dreaming. Lucid dreaming can happen in any of those, uh, at least in any of the REM stages, maybe even in other ones, but specifically in REM. Throughout the night, beginning, middle, end, it doesn't matter, usually happens later on. But the fact that it happens later doesn't make it less <coughs> meaningful, or um, lucid dreaming are still experiences, and now they're experiences that are at least guided, influenced, or, or uh, more metacognitive for you, and and I'm, I'm getting, when, uh, I'm telling you, when you wake up with tears of joy, that's, that's meaningful. That's something. I mean, even if it's not real. Is this real? I mean, <laughs> it's, just more, it's just more solid, consistent, and we take it as real. But. So we have time for two more. Yeah. Um, I'll get you then. Okay. I'm glad that this topic came up in terms of the nature and structure of the brains themselves and the nature of the process by which we recall them and reconstruct them. Mm -hmm. Because in my experience over many years of dream work, the dream itself is a holographic, multi-dimensional mm -hmm. structure that happens in an instant. And then when we try to reconstruct it in our memory, it's like we're trying to craft a story, a thread, and we only get a tiny fraction of what the dream actually contains. Mm -hmm. And so I'd be very interested in hearing what you have experienced in terms of techniques for recalling the dream that actually access the content in a different way, more holographically. My technique for doing that is not trying to tell the story of the dream, but to access the symbols, the themes, and the metadata about the dream itself. And then find and reconstruct it later as an exercise in journalism or writing, of reusing the imagination based around those themes. Is that? Yeah, that's great. Yeah. Um, I, uh, I have a practice that I call interdimensional smuggling. <laughs> and uh, what I am doing is I'm um, bringing uh, images and uh, feelings and whatever back and across. In fact, I didn't, I didn't do it because I forgot. But I, when I'm doing dream talks, I usually do them barefoot. I have a lot of dreams about being inappropriately barefoot, either because the train is rocky and cold or because it's, I was at a, at a black tie event at the Icelandic consulate and I was barefoot, you know. And so, um, or sometimes I'll be in the dream, okay, in the dream there was a barking dog. So during the day I'm, I'm looking for barking dogs or I'm, you know, I'm, I'm looking for, you know, a, you know, an onion or whatever it is. That was my last night. You know, so I'm, I'm uh, and, and I tr I'll try sometimes to bring things into the dream. You know, I have, I'm, I'm deeply in love with my VW van, and I sometimes try to bring my, my VW camper van into my dream, right? So, so interdimensional smuggling for me is a way of, of taking the, I have a friend who, um, who choreographed a dance based on uh, a movement that happened in, in one of my dreams. So it's, rather than having it be about the story, it's taking things back and forth uh, across the border. So interdimensional you, smuggling you, is kind of, yeah during that hypnagogic state while you're <clears throat> waking up. And then sometimes the lucid dreams happen for me when I actually hold that space loosely and then drop back into it again. So it is actually riding the hypnagogia and then falling back into sleep but staying. <laughs> That's my favorite thing to do in the whole world. <laughs> <laughs> Other of you? Okay. Uh, oh. Um, I would just say that uh, for me, it's and uh, in, in in people I talk to, the, the, the longer people lose the dream, the less control they actually want to exert on the dream, and I think that that makes perfect sense. It, for most people, it comes naturally as, as they go on, and that's where also <coughs> spiritual practices start to come in. And um, uh, you can't, and there's no such thing as 100% like control anyway, even if you wanted to generate an object, you didn't pick all the details, it just shows up the way it is in the general kind of sphere. Uh, but what, what I do is like, at, at some point you sort of even start playing with the sense of who is perceiving the dream. Uh, uh, happens early enough, but if you're controlling yourself and flying, but suddenly you realize that you're really seeing it from a third person perspective and you're the person in the bed dreaming, but you're sort of looking from here, who the hell is this? Um, and you can get rid of this guy and really uh, uh, start either identifying with other things in the dream or identifying with nothing in the dream and let the thing happen and see, see what it 
generates. And it's all your brain, it's not necessarily conscious control, but still with conscious awareness of it. Surfing. Yeah. Surfing. Uh, yeah, the, the, the dream recall <laughs> issue is, uh, you know, goes as far back in, in history in some ways, the, the, the sense that there's this poignant gap between the dream that we experience and the dream we're able to report in the waking world. And we know that it's, we're, we're missing something when we convey it um, in the waking world. But we do our best. Um, and, and some dreams, I mean, this is something that might, might help. I mean, there, dreams involve a, a, a variety of combinations of, of cognitive capacities. So some dreams are very imagistic. Uh, you know, there's like a powerful image, a powerful visual sensation. And that's pretty much it. And other dreams are long narratives and have a, 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 a strong sort of um, linguistic grammatical structure. So, and dreams have all combinations of those and other things. So some dreams are easy to remember the images. Some are easy to remember snatches of conversation. Um, some people have different you know, modes that are more, you know, incline them to one of those uh, directions or the other. So, um, to me, it's, the, it's the, the, the fun of kind of exploring what is your own typical dreaming pattern, and then what are the variations? When you've kind of figured out your own baseline, then you have a better opportunity to notice anomalies <coughs> and singularities. So that's where it really gets going. So the last one to my friend of Vizio, yes. So I kind of had a biology question, but I just wanted to first ask the short, quick question. If, so does anybody know of something that produces those graphs every night like the Zio used to do. Well, you know that you, you recognize it because we've talked about the Zio right. before. Yeah, this yeah. is the basic dream graph that you'll get in any kind of dream uh, the book. It's kind of your basic one, but I made it look like the Zios because I have a lot of the Zio graphs. Yeah, I mean, and that's kind of generalized. Like you can expect something like this, but the, you wake up in the morning, and the Zio would say, like, this is what you did because I was measuring it with EEGs directly on your forehead, not some kind of like. You know, janky. I moved my arm around. Right. And thought you might be on your back. Like it kind of exactly. Knew. And I don't know anything that does that anymore. That Zio's out of business. We were so just talking I, about this. I know. I know. So it's I, I purchased an open BCI, which is the Arduino-based thing. Hasn't we arrived talk about yet. That. But that's one thing I want to use to try to kind of capture it. If I can find some way to fit it to my head, so I don't fall. Off the mm. I've been doing stuff on this since we last talked. So yeah, I mean, I, the, I think you, what we really need is something like that that says this is how you did, or these are the states you were literally in during the night. And then we've got something that can also say, like, you're really in, you know, regardless of a mask kind of measuring your eyes, it's like brainwaves saying, like, you're in REM, now I'm in here. So like, you don't just get rid of the whole timer thing. Yeah, okay. um, But my biology question is, um, kind of a question of like, so who's doing the neurological research right now with like, you know, the CAT scans and the PET scans and the MRIs on people when they're dreaming to say, this is, you know, that can say for sure, your brain is releasing DMT or whatever it is that's going on. You know, what it is that's causing your dream, like, um, you know, who's, who's doing that research that's currently being published, you know, who, who would you say are like the cutting edge organizations to be kind of tracking that are doing this? Because people have theories, you know, there was like, um, you know, there there must be some people that are that are doing this. They're using like the million dollar equipment instead of like the you know five thousand dollar equipment that we can kind of maybe try to afford. It's like there's big science you could be throwing at this, and someone must be doing it. There's there you're not gonna you're gonna have a hard time finding somebody who's doing that who's gonna talk about DMT. But um, <laughs> Tori Nielsen, yeah, Tori Nielsen at the university uh, <laughs> in, in uh, at McGill in Montreal um, uh, is doing a lot of really interesting work and uh, you can, T-O-R-E Nielsen, he's got a lot of really interesting stuff. I mean specifically the yeah. pineal gland, they think it's involved. Who else? People don't even really well, know what it does. Yeah. They, you know there's, you know, eye cone, like there's similar structures to the retina of your eye on the pineal gland that's right in the center of your brain. And you know people have all these kind of theories and I'm kind of like, okay, theories we don't really need to we can have a hypothesis and test it, and we've got machines that can image that stuff, and I'm just surprised no one has addressed that question, or if they have, mm -hmm. I haven't been able to find it. Yeah, no, there's, there's a big mismatch between good questions like that and the, uh, the resources that are being devoted to answering them, and that's yeah. partly the studies are expensive, you know, getting people to go through these things. Um, sleep isn't a perfect 
phenomenon to study using current generations of brain scanning devices. People move around, you know, and you're not supposed to move around with a lot of these devices. Um, so, but the questions are good questions, and my hope is the tech is going to sort of drop in price and accessibility so people <coughs> with these questions can go about answering them. Yeah. So I, I do want to address both of your questions. Uh, there's a few people doing sort of similar thing. It's hard to get funding for some of this stuff, and there are few, people who are with overlapping research that if they get together, I think, uh, can do some incredible things. Jay Gunkelman, who spoke at one of these uh, consciousness hacking meetups, uh, was talking about at a lecture at the Neurofeedback Conference uh, about the similarities between the brain in lucid dreaming and the brain on DMT, for example, <coughs> and, and during ayahuasca, which is uh, interesting. Another guy, who, Juan something, I forgot his last name, who basically takes EEG in, 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 in all sorts of states and, and records the EEG uh, through all, all types of psychedelics, in sleep, and in, in just uh, channeling, like all, all different people. Uh, he's an interesting guy. And um, Dr. Juan. Yeah, Dr. Juan. Uh, yes. Um, yeah, you know. And uh, and when you look at even like Ursula Voss and, and, and yeah, Alan Ursula Hobson Voss. and so on, uh, I mean, in, in her lecture she talks about um, how hard it is to get to get people in these states. And I showed you my friend in, in the lab who couldn't who couldn't perform. It's just it's really hard. Uh, it took them six for the first study. It took them six months to get three lucid dreams. Six months. I mean, so that's how hard it is to do. As for the ZEO and EEG, I can't wait until there's a, a just yeah. EEG for sleep, like super slim. Uh, Iwinks, who is creating something for lucid dreaming, I told them to remove the lucid dreaming part and provide people with also a version of just the EEG for sleep, which would be like a more advanced ZEO. There's a medical version of the ZEO, clunky and, and not even as yeah, good. The ZEO still works with Android. Uh, and uh, if all goes well, Maybe the second version of our device will be able to do it as well. So I know I said that that was the last question, but Mikey said yeah. he wanted to ask one. And Can I just have a comment there to that? I answer. This is uh, EEG, which is my partner doing in Taiwan. So it's a cheap open source EEG where there's a sleep app, which basically is doing the same as CEO. What's, what's it's it? called OPE Innovation, OPE Innovation EEG. The guy who's building uh, Dr. Fucci's suit <coughs> is from Berkeley. How do you spell OK? OP and then align and innovations.com. You can order an F60. So there is, but it, it's, it's not known. It's done mostly in, in Asia. But I recommend it's a, it's a better EAG than Excellent. Here. So um, when the guy who founded the thing wants to ask a question, he gets to override the that was the last question. Yes. Uh, I got one very persistent request here for a question, so we'll okay. do them. Go ahead. So I actually wrote the Galantamine patent for Laverge, took his class. I have the Nomad Dreamer. Um, the, the, the IP is now open, so kickstart if you want to make Nomad Dreamer 2. Anybody could do it. I oh. thought someone had, but yeah, it's open. I mean, there's the REM Dreamer, it's which expired. is the same thing. It's just not the as Remi. comfortable. The yeah. REM Dreamer. Yeah, oh, the REM Dreamer. Yeah. Right, okay. Yeah. So it's out there. Um, and also, I would suggest just reading any book or article on lucid dreaming before you go to bed every night will prime your mind, and that's an easy way to. You might have one tonight if you. <laughs> right, in fact, the, the, the number one way to have a lucid dream is to expect to have a lucid dream. This is right, this is, this is well documented. Okay. And, and I have a friend that's working on creating a, um, like a blockchain database where you can have encrypted time-stamped dream logs collectively so that you can do mm -hmm. um, precognition type studies to see if it's possible. Mm -hmm. If there's like collective dreams before a large event, then mm -hmm. you can prove, you know, statistically stand out. Mm -hmm. So. Well, I want to hear more about that. Okay, so um, it just I, this is so wonderful, and this has been such an honor for us. Um, just uh, so uh, Jay, you can find as Lucid Sage, and he does the Lucid Dream podcast, and this stuff is fascinating. Kelly's work you can find under kellybulkley.com, B-U-L-K-E-L-E-Y, like Berkeley. Dot org, sorry, kellybulkley.org. You can find my work at urbandreamscape.com. We would all be glad to hear from you. Um, it's really been an honor to be here and speak with you. And as a final closing, each of you um, could give one statement, um, one tip to the audience for your number one suggestion for how to deepen our relationship mm -hmm. with our dream world. 
Uh, mine is easy, uh, is to think about dreaming as a mind state, to think about dreaming as actual consciousness hacking. So, so don't worry about the interpretation, don't worry about, you know, just, just think about it in the same way that you do your psychedelics or have your sex or do your sweat lodges or whatever. Think about it, think about it like that and just that will be enough to really deepen the relationship. Yeah, uh, a third of, around a third of your life is in sleep. A good portion of that is dreaming. It's a, it's a consciousness state that everybody experiences. And just pay attention to it. Write down your dreams. Read them later mm -hmm. on. Consider them, try consider them, uh, considering them important in some way to your mm -hmm. life. And what comes out of that is tremendous. Well, dreams often come at moments of change and transition in life. So I'd just say anytime you're going through something, births, deaths, <coughs> marriages, breakups, good things, bad things, your dreams are probably going to respond and, and just a little bit of attention in that direction, you'll probably find you'll hear a lot and learn a lot, so. Thank you. Thank you.